Hi, my name is Erfan Vafai, and I'm an Extension Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to be able to talk to you in this digital platform. Uh, I'm going to make this just as engaging as if I were there in real life. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put your hand up and uh, I will call upon you and, and definitely answer those questions. Uh, however, I do want to remind you that this is a pre-recording, so there is no real way that I can know whether you have your hand up. So I'm just going to periodically guess uh, if you're asking questions, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. You know, so the main culprits we're going to talk about today are these uh, kind of six general categories or groups. So that is thrips, white flies, and aphids. Uh, fungus gnats, two-spotted spider mites, mealybugs and scale, and flea beetles. We're going to start off with thrips. These uh, insects are in this group known as Thysinoptera. And they have this name because they have uh, fringed wings, which comes from Thysanos and Terra. So if you look here at the wings, you'll notice that there are uh, fringed wings on the tips there. So there are many different species of thrips. Uh, you can have greenhouse thrips, adult western flower thrips. This is an adult, it's of western flower thrips. And we have chili thrips. Uh, and depending on the species that you have, they may prefer certain types of plants and they may preferentially feed on certain parts of the plant. So as the name implies, a western flower thrips uh, will prefer to feed inside the flower, whereas chili thrips, you'll often find them feeding a little bit more on the stems and petioles of leaves. In terms of their general life cycle, they tend to lay their eggs in the tissue. Again, this is a tendency, uh, kind of in the plant tissue, and it stays in that egg stage between two and a half to four days. And it really depends on factors such as temperature, how long it'll stay in that egg stage. Oops, sorry. So the uh, warmer it is, the quicker they develop. So the shorter that time span. Then you get this, what we call a first instar. So this is the first immature stage that comes out of the egg. At this point, they already start feeding and they're very hard to see with the na naked eye. They're very tiny and, and almost really in there in the leaf tissue. We also then get the second instar, which also kind of hard to see with the naked eye, really helps to have some kind of a hand lens. And they are doing what's called rasping. So they're scratching at that leaf surface, causing it to bleed out and, and sucking up those juices. Then you have two life stages that don't feed and aren't quite exposed on the plant. So we have here prepupa and pupa that is typically in the soil or in the leaf litter. You'll see a little bit later on when I'm, when I'm talking about insecticides, if you're going to use one, make sure you know to follow that label. Oftentimes for thrips, it'll say spray in a seven or a 14 day interval. And it's not just because they're trying to sell you more product or get you to use more of their stuff. In this case, it's because to, you actually need to break their life cycle, right? So if you spray an insecticide, it's only getting all the life stages that are above. And if it's something that needs to be eaten, an insecticide that needs to uh, be ingested by the thrips for it to work, it's also not even working on the eggs. So really, it's only going to be working on this first, second instar and the adults that may be above uh, the soil and leaf litter as well. So these prepupa and pupa become these winged adults, only the adults have wings, the immatures do not. Now again, if you spray an insecticide and it only hits the things above, it only hits the things in the foliage, all of these pupa and prepupa can come out within the next week and you have a brand new thrips population. So that's why, again, it's important to try and hit them uh, twice in order to prevent or, or to break this life cycle. And like I mentioned earlier, they have what's referred to as rasping mouth parts. So they're not quite sucking, but the damage looks a lot like sucking damage. So you'll see here this uh, kind of stippling damage, this discoloration, because they're feeding on the chlorophyll that's inside those leaves. Next, we go on to the two spotted spider mites. So they are also very hard to see with the naked eye. And as the name implies, they have a two spots. Right down here, we can see uh, the eggs of the two spotted spider mites. If you get a very high population, at this point is considered very late, uh, too late in terms of management. And your best bet is to just toss those plants, get them out of there because they are a potential source of spider mite populations for your other healthy plants. 
So this right here, there's no amount of insecticide that can penetrate that web to get those spider mites. Your best management strategy is to toss it. Uh, this, so, you know, similar to thrips, they cause a type of sucking damage. So they are causing stippling, uh, discoloration in the leaves. In terms of their life cycle, it can be anywhere between 8 to 40 days from egg to adult. Again, that's a huge range, and that depends greatly on temperature. So you'll notice when temperatures are higher, you start to get higher insect populations, and that's because, again, they develop much quicker at higher temperatures. And the, and the same can be said for these spider mites. So from eggs, they go to what's referred to as larvae, where they only have six legs. So spiders, such as spider mites, generally have eight legs, but in this one immature stage, they only have six. And then they become uh, a first nymph stage, where it has eight legs, the second nymph stage, and then we have the adult. Going on to white flies and aphids. All right, so in terms of white flies, they are a sucking insect pest. You can actually see right here, oop, it's feeding a mouth part going into the leaf. Uh, so they are sucking uh, those plant juices. A lot of these sucking insect pests are trying to get nitrogen out of that plant. And with that nitrogen, they can make more amino acids. With amino acids make more protein. With more proteins make more babies. They are all just baby making machines. So they are essentially acting as filter feeders. So they're filtering that, that uh, phloem, they're filtering that uh, sappy solution, uh, getting the nitrogen out of it and excreting uh, the extra in what's referred to as honeydew, which is a sticky solution. It's basically plant sap minus the nitrogen. In terms of their life cycle, all right, there's a lot of uh, life stages of white flies that are difficult to see with the naked eye, starting with the eggs. And the eggs are often laid in a uh, semi-crescent uh, or in a full circle because it's a very easy way for these white flies to feed while laying eggs. So they, you know, it's got a straw in the leaf and it's feeding and it lays an egg and that turns and lays an egg and it turns and lays an egg. Uh, so on and so forth, and so that you get a nice little uh, circle. We're not seeing that circular pattern uh, here in, in particular. From there, we get the different instars. So we have first instar, second instar, third instar, and fourth instar. These are, again, the immature nymphs. You'll see they don't have wings. They look very different from the adults, and they're quite flat on the leaf and, and rather transparent. So it can be very hard to see with the naked eye unless A, you know what you're looking for, and B, you have some kind of a magnifying lens. I highly recommend just having on hand some head lenses, some jeweler lenses, uh, between 2.5 to 3.5 times magnification lenses, as they can be very handy for detecting these insects. And they're almost always, especially white flies, almost always on the underside of the leaves. So you have to flip some leaves over and look on the undersides. So after the fourth instar, we get the pupa. And at this point, uh, the white fly immature inflates, becomes quite a bit bigger uh, and more, uh, more opaque. So it's a lot easier to see with the naked eye at this point. Uh, and then we get the adult. And these white shells right here, these white transparent things, are the pupa that have emerged. So it's just basically the husk, the leftover, uh, you know, I guess you could say like the pupil casing or the cocoon casing of, of the white fly. So here it is an example. This is the pupa and you can see those two red devilish eyes looking up at you uh, saying that it's about to become a new adult to lay eggs all over your greenhouse. Carrying on. Aphids. Uh, so like I mentioned, sucking insect pests. They produce this honeydew. If you ever see a shiny leaf surface, okay, so we see this shiny leaf right here you haven't recently watered or anything like that, there's a good chance that that's honeydew. All right, so if you feel it and it feels sticky, start looking on the underside of leaves. These little white things right here, uh, those are actually white flies right there. So that's a good telltale sign that, you know, you, you've got a big population of a sucking insect pest. So again, here is that sticky leaf. And if you, you know, leave it as, as is, uh, you start to get a lot of honeydew buildup you can get this concoction of molds, all right? It's not just one specific species, it's a, it's a mix of molds that colonize that honeydew and refer to this mold as sooty mold because it basically looks like soot, right? 
Uh, so that's kind of a, um, a, a no-no. It's very hard to get the soot off the plant at this point. Uh, you know, in a uh, greenhouse production setting, this is typically considered a cull. At this point, you need to toss it. If you just have a few plants, you know, you can try taking a you know, soapy brush to it. And uh, it's a little labor intensive, but, you know, you, you could potentially clean it off some. So aphids also have a sucking mouth part. He says, yeah, I know, I suck. Yeah, so this is also a sucking insect pest. So here is this female, all right, and here's this live offspring coming right out of her rear. Uh, these organs right here refer to as cornicles, and later on uh, we'll see what those are for, but they're basically like communication uh, chimneys, so they're very important for communicating with other insects. These black dots here are not beauty moles, they're not uh, beauty marks. Those are actually the eyes of other offspring within this female. So if we dissect this female open, we can find offspring all in different stages of development, almost like a car factory line, right? So they are just constantly pumping out. And these aphids are reproducing so quickly that when that first offspring is coming out of her mother, that offspring is already producing her first offspring. So by the time a mother is, is first becoming a mother, she's already in the process of becoming a grandmother. So that's how quickly uh, these aphids are reproducing. And again, like I mentioned, you can get winged forms or non-winged forms, and you can also get different color morphs. So even though these two are the exact same species and they're uh, genetically identical, this uh, mother can turn on genes in her offspring to make them a different color. And it's thought that uh, they will change the color of the offspring in response to predator pressure. So if there's a lot of ladybugs around eating them, uh, they'll produce offspring that are red. And this red serves as a type of coloration that uh, is a type of a mimicry, basically tells the, the ladybugs like, hey, I'm, I'm dangerous because I'm red, even though they're not actually dangerous. What's happening here is this ant uh, is actually not eating the aphid, it is uh, moving the aphid and uh, moving it to a better place, to better pastures. And the reason is because these ants will actually feed on the honeydew of aphids and in return provide the aphids with protection. So sometimes aphids are referred to as ant cattle because quite literally the ants are herding them like a, a herd of cattle and they are protecting them uh, and milking their honeydew. So if you ever see ants that are randomly crawling around on your plants and on your benches, there's, that's usually a sign that there's some sucking insect pest around. So you need to start checking your undersides with your leaves uh, to see if you see any aphids or mealybugs, or it might mean that these uh, ants are looking for good places to put some of those sucking insect pests. So as a part of a very important management strategy for sucking insect pests is to also manage the ants within a greenhouse as well. Because those ants, even if you control the sucking insect pest, those ants can just move them right back in. All right, now going on to scale and mealybugs. These are both sucking insect pests and are actually quite similar, as we'll see here in a moment. So scales are sap feeding insect pest. They infest the bark, leaves, or fruit, depending on the species of scale you're dealing with. And in general, they do not typically kill the plant. There are some exceptions that we'll talk about here, but typically they're not considered detrimental. In a greenhouse setting, if you're trying to sell the plant or anything like that, uh, it's very important to keep very low numbers and to really essentially eradicate them from the greenhouse. In the landscape, on the other hand, not a huge issue. So if you have some scale on some landscape plants, um, that's, that's typically considered okay, unless, again, there are a few exceptions of scales that can kill uh, plants. And just a little bit more detail about the crepe myrtle bark scale, because this is a relatively new invasive. So again, this is what a very high infestation looks like on the left side. The female egg sac, so what we see, these white spots are actually kind of the, the matures, right? It's a female egg sac, so there's a white waxy layer that's covering the female on the inside and uh, her eggs. And she slowly releases all of her eggs and she dies inside that egg sac. Uh, whereas the males, they become this pupa. So you can see it's quite a bit smaller and longer. 
and they become uh, a winged uh, male adult. So they actually come out and then we'll look for a female to mate with. The immatures are a lot harder to see with the naked eye. So here are the large, um, again, the egg sacs. And the immatures, you can see, are a lot more exposed. They don't have as much white waxy layer around them. So a contact insecticide works against the immatures much better than it does, say, against the egg sacs. Again, just very briefly, their life cycle. Uh, we get these eggs, uh, these nymphs. Uh, and the very first stage of nymph uh, is a crawler, so it's typically rather mobile. After that, it has very limited mobility. Uh, and then the female goes into a uh, you know, female egg sac, where again, she basically just withers and, and dies in there, and that's when we get all these eggs. Whereas the male uh, becomes this pupa, and it becomes this winged adult. And like I mentioned, the cycad scale can kill uh, a cycad. So that's one of those scales that needs to be uh, managed. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're going to lose your cycad. Now, mealybugs are in this family Pseudocosidae. All right, so Cosidae is actually the word for soft scales. So soft scales, the family is, is Cosidae. So Pseudocosidae are basically fake soft scales. They're very similar to soft scales in that they produce honeydew. Uh, they have that waxy kind of, they develop this waxy layer on the outside. The difference is the females lay clutches of eggs inside uh, this waxy layer, but the female does not get stuck in there. She can lay multiple clutches, so she can kind of go on and lay some more uh, groups of eggs. We have different species of mealybugs, so long-tailed mealybug is, the, is, you know, it's aptly named because it has these two very long tails. Now, if you see something like this, right, so it looks a lot like a mealybug, but this is actually a good insect. Uh, there's typically two ways I say that you can determine the difference between a good uh, insect and a bad insect, especially in the mealybug world, is one. Um, mealybugs are typically not super mobile, or if they are, they're not moving that quick. Whereas a predatory insect, like this one, actually moves pretty quick. Uh, another way to tell, because it's hunting, another way to tell is that um, this insect will have, will be looking for and eventually have another insect in its mouth and is eating it. So that's a predator, right? So these are actually a, a type of larva of a ladybug, or what is more correctly known as a lady beetle. So this is the adult right here of this larva. And this is not this. These are uh, two different things. This is the larva of this beetle. And this right here is a type of a mealybug. So again, uh, you can tell, you know, usually the adults are not cannibalizing on their own young. I'd imagine it can happen. Uh, but uh, usually if the adults are there, it's because they have found an abundance of mealybugs to feed on. Now, sanitation is very important with mealybugs, right? So they can stick around on uh, pots and on benches and things like that for a you know, relatively long period of time. So it's important to either toss those pots or to sanitize them, sanitize benches between plantings or crops in order to reduce not only plant pathogens, right? So it's also very important for that, but also some of these insects that can kind of stick around and, and wait for some new plant material to pop up. Next, we're going to talk about fungus gnats, which are a type of a fly. All right, and, and mainly the one we're going to talk about is the Bredesia, or the dark wing fungus gnats. So you can see they have uh, relatively long legs relative to their bodies. That's one way of, of kind of distinguishing them. And we often use, we'll see a little bit later, these yellow sticky cards for uh, monitoring and trapping them. But you'll kind of, you all probably know when you have fungus gnats because they're these tiny little, very annoying flies that you get around your plant when you're trying to water and things like that. They love to get up in your face, up your nose. I guess that's, you know, their, I guess their pathway to heaven is to go up into your nose. I don't know. It seems like a major pain. But uh, they're, you know, basically just a major nuisance. But if the population gets very large, uh, you can start to get quite a bit of the larva. So these are the uh, amateur stages in the pot and they can feed on the roots and when they start to feed on the roots of the plant is when you can start to have some major problems. So here's an example of a root uh, fed on by a fungus gnat larva. You can see this larva uh, right here and uh, here's a very large population. 
right? So you can end up with a population that can really devastate your plant if you keep it very uh, wet in your pot all the time. So that's where they thrive, is a very wet environment. So if your plant tolerates it, all right, I highly encourage to go through some dry cycles, right? So dry cycles between your, your wet. Uh, poinsettias are an example where they say it does not really tolerate. You should not, you should not ever see that plant wilt. All right, so the leaves start to wilt, you've already gotten some uh, type of permanent damage. But if you can keep it from staying too wet all the time, you can greatly reduce those fungus gnat populations. Flea beetles, uh, this is the last kind of group we're talking about. And um, they're very aptly named because when you start to approach the plant, they quickly flee. So they're hard to really uh, see the culprit, right? You see all this chewing damage. You don't know what's causing it uh, because you don't really see it there. And they lay these eggs uh, in groups. And here are the larvae, the immatures. Oftentimes the, um, the, the larvae of beetles are referred to as grubs and they all kind of look similar. They have these three jointed legs near the front uh, and they don't have any fleshy legs on the lower part of their body. So caterpillars typically have some fleshy legs. So it looks like they have more than uh, three pairs of legs because they have all these extra little uh, kind of proto proto legs or, or fleshy legs on the rest of their body whereas um, beetles do not have that uh, so here's an example of a flea beetle uh, larva as well all right and they cause chewing damage all right and often more often than not um, they cause this kind of buckshot type of look so you get all these random little holes around the leaf and it's oftentimes because they are kind of picky in, in what they eat and how they eat. Uh, and so that's typically a telltale sign if you see all those random little holes that you either have some flea beetles or you have some caterpillar very young larva. So by looking on the underside of the leaf, uh, you can see whether there's any caterpillar larva there. Here's another example of a potato flea beetle. All right, so they're very small as well. You can see this one is just over one millimeter in length. We have a striped flea beetle is another example. And this one here, the red-headed flea beetle, has started to become a little bit more of a problem uh, in states such as Delaware. So they're starting to watch that a lot more closely because it's uh, causing a lot more damage in the nursery. And like I mentioned, that kind of buckshot type of damage. So you see this type of thing. This is uh, very uh, unique or, or very characteristic of flea beetle feeding. All right, and here's another example. So when you have very, uh, you know, a different type, you can sometimes get um, the beetle not chewing all the way through the leaf. Uh, they can just chew through certain layers of the leaf. All right, so we just went through this, these six groups of insects, right? Now we're going to talk about how to monitor for them, how to know if you have them in your greenhouse, and hopefully you want to catch them when you have a very low population before they really explode and become very problematic. So I highly recommend uh, getting yourself some yellow sticky cards. There's a number of different companies and places that sell them. Uh, usually, you know, you put them on these little uh, metal stakes or metal clips uh, just above the canopy of your plants. Uh, and essentially that color yellow is uh, considered rather, rather attractive to a lot of different uh, insects. And so it catches just the flying, just the adult stage of these insects. So thrips, White flies and aphids, two-spotted spider mites don't fly, so, so they're not really going to be on there. Uh, fungus gnats and flea beetles, and you can get caught on that yellow sticky card. The idea is you check that on a you know, weekly basis and gives you an idea of you know, how many thrips you have, or if you start getting thrips, or if you start getting aphids, so on and so forth. You don't use that as an absolute measure of how much pest you have in your greenhouse. Because there is, you know, there's been studies done and they don't find a good or strong correlation between the number you find on a yellow sticky card, the number you find on a plant. But it does serve as a good indicator of what pests you do have and when you start getting them. So it is an excellent uh, use for that. Uh, we also have the sucking and uh, rasping damage that we want to look for. So if we see this type of discoloration, uh, you know, it might be a nutrient. Uh, problem. It might be some kind of phytotoxicity, so that's an unintended effect of some kind of a pesticide on the plant. But there's also a good chance that it's one of these sucking or rasping insects. 
So check the undersides of those leaves uh, for any thrips, two-spotted spider mites, white flies and aphids, or mealybugs and scale. And if you can't see, you know, any actual sucking or rasping insects on there, then you might want to take a slightly uh, additional measure. And like I mentioned before, this kind of beading technique. So check out this incredible animation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna save you the trouble and replay that for you so you can see how amazing this is. The idea here is you're slapping that flower, you're beating it uh, just above some kind of a white surface or a black surface. Uh, I love to use some, I have some white foam board and inside a plastic sleeve so it lasts a long time. And I always have that uh, available in my car. So if I need to just grab it, I can quickly go and, and do some monitoring that way. If we see that yellow, uh, sorry, not yellow. If we see that uh, sticky surface on the leaves, like I mentioned earlier, that's a sign of honeydew. So you've got, I'll show you that animation one more time. So you've got some white flies and aphids or mealybugs and scale. It's not going to be hard or armored scale because remember, they do not produce honeydew. If we see the plant wilting um, and it's not due to watering, right? So it's getting enough water. Uh, there might, you know, again, there are things outside of what we have discussed that can cause it, right? So it could be nutrient deficiency. It could be uh, some kind of plant disease. Uh, or it could be something that's actually sucking the juices out of that plant. So you might have a very high population of two-spotted spider mites, Y flies and aphids, or mealybug and scale. Or if there's no apparent sign of anything feeding on it above the plant, that's when you have to take it out of the pot and inspect the roots. And that's when you might have some fungus gnat larvae, for example, feeding on the roots, or it might be some other kind of plant pathogen that is attacking the roots. And again, like I mentioned, these head lenses are, are uh, excellent to have for all of these insects. Uh, either a head lens or some kind of a hand lens uh, are all going to go uh, far away uh, to, to uh, you know, monitor these insects. And I highly re recommend, you know, especially in a, in a teaching setting where you're trying to be uh, systematic, uh, trying to be um, very kind of organized in, in, in method, uh, methodological in how you do some of this work, is to create some kind of a spreadsheet uh, that um, you can record your information. And the reason is, you know, if you're monitoring, I'd say once a week, go out there and randomly sample all your plants and look for thrips or aphids or two-spotted spider mites and so on and so forth. And the idea is that year after year, you'll start to collect some very valuable data and information on all the different types of plants you're growing, what types of pests they get, and what time of year they tend to get them. And so this way, you might get uh, some very valuable information that will help you hone in on when you can expect certain pests to become problematic. So this is just an example of a spreadsheet. Uh, from Mr. Awesome's Nursery, which is just, I'm very grateful that they uh, lent me their spreadsheet here. And here's an example, right? So, uh, you know, you print one of these sheets for every time you're monitoring, you know, you enter the date, the scout name, right? So this is Mr. Awesome himself, which plot, so this is Greenhouse 3. Uh, if you have just one type of crop in, in that greenhouse, you know, you can put that up here in Zinnias. If it's a very diverse crop, you might put that uh, as another row. So you type in zinnia, you know, you put like crop here and, and, and zinnia uh, into this row. And again, same goes for crop stage. Uh, and then here you can see sample, like one through four. All right, so this is just randomly selecting a plant or it might be a targeted sampling. Let's see a plant that you think has a pest. And then you're gonna start doing some ratings. So, you know, damage rating from rasping or sucking insect or defoliation. So one being none, five being a lot. Infestation rating. So instead of counting every aphid, you might just rate it from one to five again. So no aphids. Oh, there were some thrips, um, no armyworm, some two-spotted spider mites. And you did a, a beating. Maybe you did you know five slaps onto a piece of a whiteboard and you counted four thrips fell off and maybe some kind of predatory mite. So that'd be a small spider that's moving very quickly and it looks like it's hunting, it's looking for another spider to eat. And again, so over time, so you're collecting all this data and having zeros is also very valuable. Knowing that there's no insect pest there, 
uh, is also very valuable for knowing, hey, my zinnias never get a pest or my zinnias never get a pest in uh, May and June. It's only in July and August that it gets a pest. So again, having those zeros is, is very important for that. We always have a certain threshold. So when you start monitoring, right? So just because you have seen a one aphid does not mean uh, that you need to go in there and start spraying a pesticide or, or you know fumigate your entire greenhouse or burn it all to the ground. Uh, usually there's some threshold, right? So a certain number of aphids, a certain number of white flies, after which it's time to, to take some, some type of measure against it. And one way to develop this threshold to know, you know how many before we actually do something is to develop what we call an economic or an uh, action threshold. This is no simple task, uh, but the, the general principle, the general idea behind it is that, you know, with increasing pests on that plant, the cost of the damage starts to increase, right? So if only have one aphid on there, the cost of the damage it's causing is very low. Whereas if you have a lot of aphids, the cost of the damage caused by those aphids is very high. At the same time, there's a cost to spray insecticide, right? So that cost stays relatively consistent. So we're gonna put this $2 signs, right? So your bottom line is that if you spray when you only have you know, one aphid or very few aphids on your plant, you are losing money. You're spending more money on management than the damage caused by the aphid alone. Uh, on the other hand, if you spray when the population is a bit higher, you kind of break even. And there's at some point where spraying uh, saves you money because by spraying, uh, the cost of the spray is a lot less and the cause damage by the insect pest. And that's what you want to find. You want to find that threshold. Sometimes uh, just because you get an aphid or two on there doesn't mean you're going to get a very large population because there are things, there are uh, natural, natural pathogens that can kill those aphids, beneficial insects that can eat them up, and the next week your population can just go back down. So again, very important to just keep a very close eye on your, on your pest population and, and only treat when you hit that threshold. So these are just some examples of action thresholds. I'm not telling you to use these. These vary a lot depending on the plant because the cost of the damage, for example, depends greatly on the plant. So if you have uh, aphids feeding on, uh, I don't know, some, some major cash crop, right? Uh, you know, just 10 aphids is too much. It's causing a lot of damage to that important crop. Whereas if you have 10 aphids on a weed that you're not even selling, the value of the damage they're causing is zero because you don't care about that weed. So again, uh, this stuff is very um, specific, but it's just to give you an example. So for example, thrips, it might be 25 to 50 thrips per yellow sticky card. So in this case, you can use yellow sticky cards to give you an idea of that threshold with about three traps per 10,000 square feet. With two spotted spider mites, it might be more than 10% of the plants are infested. And with white flies and aphids, white flies, it could be three adults per leaf, or aphids, three to four aphids per terminal leaflets, and 50% of the leaves infested. Again, so this just gives you an idea of how to, you know, some types of numbers or, or how to develop some thresholds. So first things first, we want to try to prevent some of these pests. That's our first line of defense. With thrips, so if we have flowering plants that are, you know, spent flowers, prune them off into a bag and remove them. It's like Western flower thrips are going to be within those flowers. And if you can remove the ones that are spent, you can redu greatly reduce a large part of the population. If row covers and mesh, so in the case of greenhouses, you might look at thrips proof netting where appropriate. So if you have a vented greenhouse, you might look into uh, that, that thrips proof netting that essentially pre prevents thrips from coming in consideration is that if it is exhausted, if you do have a fan blowing, you need to make sure that the surface area of that thrips uh, proof net is sufficient to allow for appropriate airflow. So make sure to look into that if, if you're considering that option. Another possibility is reflective mulch. There is, so there are some uh, studies, some work done, and there are some sprays that you can put on your greenhouse uh, that, for example, reduce some of the UV or reflect some of the UV. And uh, it is that, that UV light of plants that thrips will usually use uh, as one particular cue to find plants. And so by putting a, using a reflective mulch, they have more difficulty finding the actual plant material. 
two spotted spider mites. We want to definitely remove weeds. Definitely remove pet plants from the greenhouse. I know most of you probably have some pet plants that are sticking around the greenhouse. It might be sources of all kinds of uh, pests. I want to make sure to remove those out or isolate them in a way that they are not uh, a cause of, of, of constant pests into the greenhouse. I want to avoid dusty conditions. In dry, dusty weather, two-spotted spider mites really thrive. And so one way is actually just periodically, if you're watering, water overhead, or periodically hose off the plant. So make it a more wet and humid environment, and those two-spotted spider mites will not do nearly as well. Avoid broad-spectrum insecticides. If you use seven, if you use, which is the active ingredient, is carbaryl. I highly suggest looking at other options uh, because that insecticide in uh, many cases works better against the predators, the natural predators of the spider mites than the spider mites themselves. So you might use seven to kill flea beetles or kill aphids, but then all of a sudden a week or two later you notice spider mite populations blow up and that's because you've just inadvertently created another problem. And lastly, over fertilization. So there have been some studies shown that in some cases you can reduce the recommended fertilizer rate by 50%, still get the main, uh, same amount of flower growth and flowering, but greatly reduce your spider mite populations. And the reason is, like I mentioned earlier, excess nitrogen really feeds these insects. For white flies and aphids, you want to re remove nearby hosts. So even outside the greenhouse, like I mentioned, if there are ants, they can just grab them and bring them in. So if you have weeds on the outside, remove those weeds, especially if, if you see any signs of aphids or white flies on them. Again, pruning or removing uh, parts of the plant that are highly infested, avoid over fertilization and use reflective mulch. Mealy bugs and scales, you'll notice a pattern here. Again, avoid over fertilization. Uh, avoid broad spectrum insecticides like carbaryl or seven again. Uh, avoid infested cuttings. If you are getting in uh, poinsettia cuttings and you're rooting them yourself, inspect them very closely. All right. Uh, take a quick look at them, or maybe just a subsample of them, uh, and remove any plants that look like they have infestation. Don't don't pot them up. Don't keep them. Bag them and get rid of them, because uh, by potting them up, you're giving that insect an opportunity to reproduce and just go on to neighboring plants and, and keep their populations going. We want to remove uh, or, or avoid, I should say, stressed plants. That makes them more susceptible to, to scale and mealybugs. And uh, we want to also, like I mentioned earlier, uh, make sure we sanitize or discard any infested pots, sanitize benches. We also want to avoid unnecessary moisture. This is for fungus gnats, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, we want to avoid incompletely composted organic matter. It can be an excellent source of fungus gnats, so make sure it is completely uh, composted. And also if you have infested peat, so if you're using peat in your potting soil, you want to make sure that it is not infested. So sanitize that or change your source or don't use peat. Um, oftentimes under the bench can also be very wet, so we want to make sure to try and reduce how wet it's staying or uh, essentially treat under the bench as well, sanitize under the bench to prevent those, um, those fungus gnats from building up their populations there. For flea beetles, we want to remove alternative weed hosts. Again, that's very similar to a lot of these other pests really. And protect the seedlings with row cover or netting. So they are a much larger uh, insect compared to say thrips. So you can use a larger mesh or netting to essentially cover the plant and protect it from flea beetles, especially at the young stage when they're really vulnerable to being killed by flea beetles. When they're quite a bit older, they can tolerate some damage by them and be okay. Next, I'm gonna talk about biological control. So that's the you know beneficial insects that are naturally occurring. Some of them, there's actually some companies that mass produce them and sell them. I don't encourage that second option in a smaller uh, greenhouse type setting because usually the economics don't really work out. And uh, if you're buying from a resupplier, so there are some companies that sell in smaller quantities, what they're doing is they're buying them in bulk from another company, repackaging them and then selling them to you. And as you can imagine, um, a, a you know living insect being shipped from one facility to another uh, that's in a you know cooled in order to keep it uh, from developing too quickly. 
brought out of the package, warmed up, repackaged, recooled, sent out again, is not going to be nearly as viable uh, as, as something that comes straight from, from the source. So these things can be relatively pricey, again, um, because they, are, they come in bulk, they come in large quantities to, to treat large greenhouses. But some naturally occurring ones include predatory thrips, we have green lacewings, minute pirate bugs, mites, and parasitic wasps. We'll talk about some of these here in a moment. So some examples of predatory thrips, you might see these black ones and where the wings have these black bands. This is actually a type of a predatory thrips that will feed on, on other uh, thrip species. So here's an example of that immature. And it's actually feeding on another immature uh, thrips species. If you've ever seen these before, right? So these little eggs on a single thread. These are lace wing eggs. Uh, and specifically, um, this is the green lace wing. Uh, they are nocturnal, so at nighttime, if you leave some night lights on, you can see them flying around about the size of a, of a quarter or smaller. And they lay those eggs, and out come these uh, little dragons, all right? Sometimes referred to as ant lions. Uh, they have these mandibles, these pincers. They essentially penetrate the side of a soft-bodied insect. So here's an aphid in its in its confines, and uh, it's going to inject digestive fluids inside that aphid and then suck it dry. So it's uh, you know when I tell you things like this, um, you can be very grateful that you're not the size of an insect and you are as large as you are. All right, we also have two spotted spider mites. Some things that feed on them are predatory mites are very prevalent and work very well, naturally or releasing them. And again, that's why some insecticides when applied can cause a problem because they may have unintentionally killed some predators that you did not know were there before. So these predatory mites do a very good job at keeping two spotted spider mites in check. Again, dry, dusty conditions or high fertilizer can result in these two spider spider mites also exploiting a population. And we have these minute pirate bugs. So I mentioned that for thrips as well. They are very, very small, uh, and they have this distinct kind of, whoop, I'm sorry. They have this distinct uh, kind of white diamond shape on, on the rear, and they have a sucking, piercing mouth part, which usually feeds on eggs or very young life stages of other small insects. White flies and aphids, mealybugs and scales have parasitoids, uh, lady beetles, lacewing larvae, surfer fly larvae, big eyed bugs, and minute pirate bugs. Talking about parasitoids, this is basically the movie Alien, all right? Alien took their idea from us poor, penniless entomologists. We didn't see a dime for it. All right, it's not like we invented this, but. Uh, here's an example of what a parasitic wasp does, right? So it, it, this is the wasp. It's tiny. You can see it's just a little bit bigger than the aphid. And it lays an egg inside this aphid as the aphid continues to feed. So here it is. Boom. That aphid continues to feed as this egg develops inside the aphid, becomes a larva which feeds on the aphid, until nothing is left but the carcass of the aphid and a pupa or a cocoon underneath. And then out comes a new wasp uh, and, and leaves that aphid. So this is what we refer to as an aphid mummy. So if you ever see some aphids that look kind of inflated uh, and it looks like there is uh, something under them, they are dead. They could be bronze, black, uh, kind of goldish in color, brown. I mean, these different, uh, depending on the species of, of wasp that's laid an egg in it. Uh, that's usually a good sign that you have some, some beneficial wasps. They don't do anything to people. They're tiny. You might even confuse them for fungus gnats. They're so small, uh, but they will not fly into your mouth. So that's a benefit there. All right. So then uh, lady beetles. We all know what uh, lady beetles are. Uh, we might not know exactly what they do. So here's uh, an example of a lady beetle eating an aphid. You'll notice as soon as that happens, these little drops form on, this, on the rear of this aphid. This is known as alarm pheromone. Remember I mentioned it's a communication chimney. So this alarm pheromone comes out of that, that chimney there, those uh, cornicles or siphunculi, and that chemical goes into the air, and all these aphids here on the left can detect it when they're antennae. And they start to freak out and decide that this area is no longer safe. So they're going to pick up their bags and go somewhere else. And I also mentioned surfid fly. 
So it looks a lot like a bee, okay, but it's actually a type of a fly, so it doesn't have a stinger at all. And it has what's referred to as a sponging mouth part. So it's feeding on nectar and pollen by just sponging its mouth on there. And uh, it lays eggs near soft-bodied insects. And those eggs come out as these little uh, larvae here that will then feed on aphids. You'll notice they look a lot like, <clears throat> and, and pardon my language, bird turd. And uh, that's because, again, it's thought it's a type of mimicry. It's a type a way of protecting itself, right? If you look like a nice, juicy, delicious worm, oh man, those birds are going to eat you up. But if you look like bird turd, only the birds that are sick in their minds are maybe going to try and eat you. So uh, that's a kind of a defense strategy to, to protect themselves. And these here are specifically the uh, milkweed aphids. So if you ever grow milkweed from monarch butterflies, you, you're going to get these beautiful bright orange aphids that feed on it. Uh, and you can get these surfeit fly larvae that get on there, join the party, and eat them all up. For fungus gnats, we have some beneficial nematodes. These are tiny, like almost microscopic worms that uh, are basically used as a drench. All right, so you can buy them from BASF is one uh, major company that, that uh, sells them. Copert is another. Uh, and they're used almost like an insecticide. They're like sprayed or drenched into the pot. And those worms go down and they infect um, the, the fungus gnat larva in the soil and works very effectively at uh, eliminating those fungus gnats out of there. We also have predatory mites. That these are ones that uh, dwell on the soil uh, or in the soil and again can uh, feed on those uh, immatures. We have Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. So this is a type of uh, a bacteria. More specifically, it's actually the toxin that this bacteria produces that they formulate into an insecticide. Uh, and lastly, we have these hunter flies. They are these flies that perch up uh, typically on little strings or, or you know anything you're hanging up above on the greenhouse. And they're very small, smaller than a house fly, uh, but they will catch other insects in the air, such as fungus gnat uh, adults, and will eat them up. And with flea beetles, uh, we have some parasitic wasps that can work against them. All right, so the last category here is insecticides. And like I mentioned, uh, you know this is gonna be a little bit limited here. And I want to make it very clear that this is no uh, catch-all or, or uh, works, works in all scenarios or in all plants. And I'm only going to give you the active ingredient. So when you look at an insecticide label, you have some kind of trade name on the label. And then in the bottom where it says active ingredients, you're going to see, or, or ingredients, you're going to see something that says active ingredient. And that's the chemical that's actually uh, doing the harm to the insect. That's actually killing it. The other stuff in there is like synergists, things that might detox, you know, prevent the insect from detoxifying. They might be spreaders, things that help the insecticide spread on the leaf or to penetrate the leaf, so on and so forth. So with thrips, some of the active ingredients to look for. Two top ones I recommend uh, to look into are abamectin and spinosad. All right, these are two active ingredients uh, that can, can be quite effective. From there, we have azadiractin, which actually comes from neem seeds, which is a, you know, a botanical. It comes from a plant. Uh, we have Boveri bassiana, which is a type of a beneficial fungus. Uh, we have insecticidal soaps or oils or pyrethrins. And this comes, uh, pyrethrins come from chrysanthemum plants, so it's also considered a botanical. These insecticidal soaps often work by washing off the waxy layer uh, or disrupting the waxy layer off an insect. Now, waxy layer is important for retaining water. So these insects being as tiny as they are, water retention is very important, otherwise they just dry out. This waxy layer protects that water. By using insecticidal soap, you are essentially uh, making them susceptible to desiccation. However, it won't work that well. This goes with diatomaceous earth as well, uh, if you have a very humid environment. So typically there's a little bit more limitation. And oils, you need to be very careful, you can burn your plants. So uh, in the heat of the day, uh, with direct sunlight, uh, your plants can suffer as a result of an oil application. So you to be very careful there. With two spotted spider mites, bifenazate and atoxazole are two kind of considered uh, relatively effective active ingredients to look for. 
but we have some others, um, apomectin, esequinosil, uh, insecticidal soaps, oils, and pyridabin. For white flies, I mentioned earlier that there are some uh, of different biotypes, and depending on the biotype, uh, you can have resistance. And there is an excellent publication from University of Florida specifically about white fly management program for ornamentals. They have some for vegetables as well. I highly recommend if you if white flies are a constant problem, just you know Google white fly management program, University of Florida, and you'll you'll see uh, some of their publications on there. But um, in general, some insecticides that work against uh, both biotypes, Bovaria bassiana, Flu peridiferone, Spire tetramat, and Cyantranilaprol. We also have these horticultural oil or insecticidal soaps will also work against both biotypes, but again, limited on when you can use them. So it won't work that well in high humidity and direct sunlight or heat, and you can burn up your plants. For mealybugs, uh, we have flu pyridiferone for mealybugs, spire tetramat for mealybugs, cyanotranilaprol that works well for soft scale, pyoproxifen that works well for soft and hard scale. We also have buprovazine we found works very well, for example, on crepe myrtle bark scale. So that works well on soft scales, whereas cyfluthrin can work well on hard scales. We do have some systemic insecticides as well, so such as dinotefuran or imidacloprid that will work quite well against most mealybugs and most soft scales as well. So when I say systemic, sorry, I should specify, those are chemicals that when you apply them to the soil, they go up into the plant and anything feeding on the plant uh, is killed and it can provide protection for a very long period of time. Now, the reason why I haven't written those down here is because uh, some of those chemicals have been implicated in causing a lot of harm to pollinators. So it's going into the plant. Some of it can end up in the pollen and nectar. And we still just don't have quite enough information to know whether it's getting in there in harmful uh, dosages. For fungus gnats, we have a whole suite of insecticides, some of which I mentioned earlier. But really, this is one you want to try to prevent. So if you can reduce uh, you know, the, the pots uh, from being too wet or the very wet environment, that can go a very long way. Otherwise, you have acidimaprid, which is a systemic, azadiractin, bifenthrin, bacillus thuringiensis, or BTI, deltamethrin, fluvalinate, permethrin, pyrethrin, and pyroproxifen. For flea beetles, again, we also have several options. I think most people resort to carbaryl or 7-dust. Uh, again, I recommend using that as a last resort. Don't, you know, don't rely on that as your first line of defense. Uh, you have some other options. I would maybe focus first on things like azadiractin uh, or bifenthrin, spinosad, or permethrin or pyrethrins. These will be a little bit more targeted, have a little bit less residual, and um, will, will basically you know, have less likelihood of, of causing a secondary outbreak of another pest. The last thing I want to cover was insecticide resistance. So how do insects become resistant to insecticides? A, insects learn to overcome insecticides that have been sprayed repeatedly. B, insects with some resistance survive and produce offspring that can be more resistant. Oops, sorry. C, spraying the same insecticide repeatedly makes it easier for insects to detoxify the insecticide. Or D, because of Obama. Correct. If you guessed because of Obama, no, I'm kidding. The correct answer here is B. Insects with some resistance survive and produce offspring that can be more resistant. So this is the you know, process of natural selection. So you have some variation of the population. That means some have some natural resistance already built in, or some are less resistant. And you spray, those ones that are a bit resistant survive, and they reproduce the other ones that are a bit resistant. You end up getting some that are even more resistant, end up getting some that are even less resistant. So, um, you know, then again, you, you spray and you're selecting again for those that are a bit more resistant. So what we want to look at here is when you look at uh, an insecticide label, you're going to see that it belongs to this group. Okay, this group number 4A. 
that is specific to the way that that insecticide works on the insect. So if you're spraying insecticides, you want to make sure you're changing that number. Because if you act on the exact same mechanism of an insect over and over and over again, that's when you start selecting for resistance. It doesn't matter if the active ingredient is different. If it acts on the exact same part of the insect, it's as if you're spraying the same thing. So we want to make sure we are uh, rotating our group numbers. Now, not all labels, especially if it's an older insecticide, have the group number right on the label. So we can actually look these up. All right, so this one here, for example, is a metacloprid. We can actually look these up, again, on that IRAC-online website. So if I type in a metacloprid in this website here, under modes of action, you can see it's under group 4A. Okay, it's a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor competitive modulator. That's exactly what I thought it was. All right, now I want to see if I can rotate it with dinotefuran. That's another insecticide I have in my locker. Ah, shoot, that's also a 4A. No bueno. Well, you know what? I'm going to use that 7-dust. Forget that air font guy. Let's see what group it's in. It's in 1A. All right, so you can rotate a 4 with a 1, not a 4 with a 4. So you can use a metacloprid and then follow it up with carbaryl and prevent insecticide resistance that way. Now, I do recommend a couple uh, free resources that you can get. You can print yourself and bind them. Uh, they're excellent field guides for, uh, for example, thrips identification. If you go to this firstdetector.org, uh, they have this uh, PDF stack there available for download. We also have a mealybug field guide. All right, so this is all for mealybugs and mealybug lookalikes, including some of their predators. Again, also at that first detector. Uh, website. So thank you so much. Uh, at this time, I will take any questions, um, but I will not be able to answer because I, again, can't actually hear and or see you right now. So uh, I guess if you have any questions, you can fire me an email here at airfon.vafi at ag.tamu.edu. I also have a website, sixleggedaggy.com. I'm also on Facebook. If you want to follow there, I periodically post information about insect identification, things to watch out for, pests, uh, new insecticide trials we've done, and so on and so forth. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, I hope you, you, have, you found some valuable information there for you.